Welcome to Possibility Project. This is a disruptive conversation series where social sector leaders talk about the big questions we need to answer now. We're so thrilled because this is our 10th episode. Oh my gosh, it's been a long time coming. And uh, we are ha we have all of our previous recordings, um, the last nine episodes on YouTube, so check them out. The channel's in the chat. And I want to begin today by sharing some Zoom introduction guidelines. I'm going to be using uh, guidelines that our speaker from episode eight on design and healing, Nova Wren, has passed along to us from Genesis Healing Institute. And you're welcome to access these and use them uh, as, as much as you'd like. It's open source. So my name is Devin Davey. My pronouns are she and her. And our intention for entering this time together today is to hold space for meaningful connections, conversations and expansive learning. So this is a super special episode because as you see, we don't have featured guests, but instead you have Heather Hiscox and myself who are gonna be leading the conversation today. So uh, I'd like to share a visual description of myself. I have brown eyes, brown hair, I'm wearing uh, yellow dangly earrings and I have a striped tan and brown uh, turtleneck sweater on. Also note that we will have a transcript available after the episode today that is gonna be produced by Otter for greater accessibility for everyone. So I'm coming to you from land that was kept and held secret by the Ohlone people. Um, and with that territory, territory acknowledgement, um, it's something that I just wanna recognize that that is one small piece of disrupting and dismantling the colonial structures that we live in today by naming the land that I'm on, small, small piece. And if you wanna learn more about how this lightly touches the surface of power and privilege, Heather's gonna share some resources in the chat about land acknowledgement. And um, one of our guests today, Stan, has actually shared additional uh, resources, uh, nativeland.ca, that is, that is awesome to look at too. Now I'd like to take a moment for Heather and I to introduce ourselves. And as a way of introduction, we like to start with some storytelling. So bringing a human element into the conversation about ourselves, um, I will add our bios into the chat, which is kind of fun. Um, we, we've done that for all of our speakers in the past and it's just a great way for y'all to get to know us a little bit better, um, given that we've been behind the scenes for nine episodes and now we are in front and center this episode. So um, let's see, two things you may not know about Heather by judging her appearance uh, are things that she's gonna share. So Heather, why don't you take us away? Yeah, we wanted to also have to tell a, a fun little story to get started like we do our speakers. So um, two things you may not know about me is that my grandmother is Tika. She's Costa Rican, born and raised in San Jose. And uh, you wouldn't know that from looking at me. My mom's name is Rosita Alvarado. And so we have a, a Latin family that most people don't know I have that background. And the other thing that's interesting about me that you don't know from looking at me is that I wear a hearing aid in my right ear um, nearly full time, except when I'm sleeping. Um, when I was little, I was about eight, I was roller skating in an indoor roller skating park, fell down and cracked my skull in two different places. And so after multiple surgeries, I was left with um, permanent hearing loss. And so I use a hearing aid and lip reading and all those other accommodations that I figured out since I was a kiddo to get through the world. So yeah, want to share those. And Devin, what about you? Take it away. Oh my goodness. Uh, something you wouldn't know about me uh, by looking at me is that I played competitive sports my whole life up until college. And I was in a national competition in Denver, Colorado when I was a little girl with horses. And if y'all are familiar with riding horses or equestrian sports, I did a sport called vaulting for about 10 years of my life from five to 15. And uh, vaulting is a sport where it's basically combining gymnastics and horseback riding. And so you have a horse that runs around a, an arena and you're on the back of the horse kind of moving around and doing gymnastics. 
So that um, really speaks to my competitive nature. I also grew up with two brothers and two boys in the house, my dad raising us. And so um, com competition and animals have always been a big part of my life, which I imagine might be similar for many of you as well. Awesome. So I just added some chat links and um, bear with us as I do some of the facilitation and chat stuff. Um, and um, right now we want to talk about our agenda of what we're going to go over today. So really, we, we want to talk about um, the goals of why we started Possibility Project. Um, we wanna talk about our why a bit of what was behind starting this series and what the motivations were for Heather and I. Um, you can see our main goals, our, our last goal around examining our role in transformation and starting with ourselves was something that we added in the last couple of episodes because we, we, we just sensed that it was a more of a call out that we needed to have around the deep internal inner work that us, this community as leaders needs to really lead. Um, so moving forward in our agenda, we're gonna talk about the themes and trends that we've seen across the last nine months and many conversations with awesome disruptors like yourselves across the country. And um, we'll introduce why, why we think Possibility Project is unique, um, what we think the kind of trends are ahead for not only this project, but also in, in the social sector, um, based off of feedback and conversations that we've had with y'all. And, and then we'll, we'll show you a, a little video that we are super excited to reveal. No one externally has seen it yet. So y'all are gonna be the first to see it. And then we will wrap by sharing topics and conversations that we're gonna be highlighting next year. All right, so our why. I wanna to turn to Heather and I wanna ask you why you wanted to start Possibility Project and what you love about it. Yes. Why I wanted to start it is that um, over my career as a social entrepreneur, this is my fifth venture, um, I have had extraordinary conversations with amazing people all over the country, learning about how they see the world, learning about their work. And I'm really um, stimulated by meeting new people and hearing their stories and then figuring out how I can connect to their work, how I can elevate it or add to it or spread the word about it. So it really was a way to kind of scale those conversations of how do we invite a community of change makers into conversations like that so that lots of diverse voices can be involved. Um, and really what drives my curiosity is um, thinking about like, why haven't we achieved the goals and vision that we have for ourselves as a sector? What could we do better? And who and what is in our way? That really is what fuels um, the conversations that I have and around this work. And um, I really think that this is an interesting and unique place to come because it's it's a place for change makers to come and have conversations on the regular, right? People that have said like, I'm disruptive, I'm here for change. I wanna meet other people like me and find my network. Um, so I love that. And I love that our speakers have very different perspectives. We always tell them like, don't arrive with like your three talking points from your PR team. We want you to show up as you and be vulnerable and authentic. And I think our speakers have absolutely shown up with their best and we've really gotten to understand their viewpoints and grow and learn from them. So that's that's my favorite part of what we've been able to do. What about you, Devin? Oh, I love that. I love that. Thanks for sharing. For me, I wrote down a couple things that I wanna make sure to touch on. So I'm gonna be looking at my notes as you've already seen. Um, I, let's see, honestly, as of April, 2020, I just was tired of the status quo. I was tired of the same old narratives that the nonprofit sector and the social sector suffers from, often white and often male dominated conversations. Uh, I, I'd been feeling this way for a couple of years and was ready to do more about it than really just talk about it in my small social circles or professional circles. Um, 
And I was ready to move beyond my current work to kind of change the narrative in a lot of different ways. And um, I love convening. I'm a convener at heart. I'm a project manager. I love the strategy and operations. And being able to convene people just seemed like a really natural next step for me. Um, it, it feels like, you know, the authenticity and the connection that convening can bring um, was something super fulfilling for me and also of service to the sector and hopefully other people. And so it was like win, win, win. So I'm also someone who sees possibilities where others see obstacles. And I really enjoy thinking creatively on how to do things differently. So Heather and I were talking like, what if we could scale those conversations and have them with more people? And um, that's really where it was born. Um, as a capacity builder, working across social enterprise, foundation, nonprofits, networks, and, and B Corps, um, I felt a, a, a responsibility to leverage my impact given the pandemic. And um, I think that's maybe similar for a lot of folks on this call and a lot of other capacity builders or consultants or designers um, of like, just more has to change and I need to be a part of that. Um, so what do I love about Possibility Project? I love essentially that we're having meaningful conversation after meaningful conversation about really the same topics, but with a different lens. So whether it's design, philanthropy, leadership, consulting, the thorough line is equity. And that requires a deep conversation and understanding that isn't gonna be solved in one go. So the ongoing nature is something that really excites me. Um, the last thing I'll say about Possibility Project that I love, because the list goes on and on and I could talk forever, <laughs> uh, is that this year in 2020, I sent the intention of consciously integrating in a better way my personal and professional life. And so that means showing up as my full authentic self in the spaces that I'm in. And this has looked like working with clients and collaborators who've become such great friends over the last year. So this is a true, um, this is a true statement, integrating my life for both of my clients right now with um, Blue Heart Action, which is a fund run by Lindley Knees, and then Actera, which is a uh, environmental activism organization run by Lauren Weston, who both have become really good friends of mine. And I will just say that has been true with Heather running Possibility Project, um, just having that deep personal and professional integration has really blown my mind this year. So I'll pause there. Um, I should have said more. All the things that Devin said. <laughs> All the things I said plus what Devin said. <laughs> Is there anything else, Heather, that you want to add? No, I, I, I don't. I, it's just been such a great journey and an adventure, and I can't wait for 2021 and season two. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. It's all the learnings. I think we've definitely evolved as individuals. And for those of you who've joined early on in Possibility Project, you've seen the evolution of our facilitation, of our engagement, of our speakers' conversations. I think all of it has really um, kind of evolved to hopefully, you know, a deeper, uh, deep, deeper level. Um, okay, so um, looking back, we are going to just do a bit of a recap of where we've come so far. Um, this is our 10th episode. We thought that 10 was a really great number in the series of conversations of um, kind of picking up the threads and going deeper. In a lot of ways, we've had 25 amazing speakers. I believe, Heather, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe 21 or 22 are all black and Latinx voices who have joined us, which is super exciting. Um, thanks, Sasha. Congrats for the 10. Yay. <laughs> um, we've engaged, I think it's actually probably more around uh, 1400 folks who are self-selected disruptors in the social sector across spaces. Um, that's pretty amazing. These are folks who have said, I want to do things differently. And this is how I'm disrupting my work or my organization. Um, and, and then we've had a subset of that group follow in LinkedIn, which still 300 plus people is super exciting to have an active conversation and, you know, building a community in COVID where we're all so pulled in different ways, I think is something really exciting. Um, and these people have come together pretty naturally. 
we've created a highlights reel that is the first six episodes that we're going to watch a little bit later. And it's super powerful. There are super powerful quotes from each of our first six episode speakers that y'all are going to get to see. And then we just today launched our website, possibilityproject.org. So check it out. We'll put it in the chat. Yay. <laughs> I like all the confetti. Um, okay. Moving forward. Heather, I think, are we going to talk about, okay, good. So these are the two questions that have guided each of our conversations thus far, and you know them well. The first one is what dysfunctions in the social sector do you want to see disappear with the virus? And the second one is what's emerging that gives you hope for what could be possible? So Heather and I are going to answer each of the questions with a synthesis from all of our episodes for about the next 15 minutes. And we invite our speakers and frequent flyers who are those of you who have attended a few or more episodes. I see y'all on this call, Stan, Chuck, others, Sasha. Um, so we will ask you to chime in on the answers to these questions as well. And we're gonna start with Heather. So Miss Heather, what are the dysfunctions in the social sector that you wanna talk about? Yeah, what, what we did is we look through all of the episodes so far and we try to pull out themes. Like what have we noticed around dysfunctions that popped up again and again and again? And there's really five key themes and I'll just talk about each one lightly. Um, the overarching theme is about who gets access, right? Who gets access to resources, leadership positions, design decisions, policy creation, and ultimately who has access to power. I think power has been a great through line of a lot of the conversations we have and the, the restriction of access to power is a huge issue with dismantling and reimagining the sector. Um, the next thing that has popped up a lot is white supremacy in this sector. And if we look at the formation, composition and structures of essentially the nonprofit philanthropic sectors, we're looking at a majority of white folks that are designing and leading the sector. So a lot of our speakers um, like Andrew Plumley, Lakia Cherry, Sean Thomas Brightfield, especially on our whiteness of the social sector episode, um, address how we need strong voices and different voices to challenge status quo. And you know what's really popped up again and again is that to create systemic change means creating discomfort and really upending the ways um, and the people that are in power right now. And so figuring out what does that look like and why is that conversation uncomfortable and what do we do to change things moving forward so we have systemic change? Um, dismantling false narratives has been another really key theme. And I love Daryl Lester um, in our episode really talked about the issue that the narrative of giver and receiver, producer and consumer, kind of who are the gatekeepers of who gets to be a philanthropist and who's seen as a beneficiary or recipient and seen as like, asset deficient. I love that he um, he raised that and a lot of other of our speakers have talked about false narratives. Sabrina Slade talked about the false narrative of trickle down impact that um, you know organizations mostly grassroots and BIPOC led are getting pennies on the dollar because they're seen as collaborators in these larger, more well-funded, more typical, um, more palatable organizations and leadership. And that's just such, it's driven by this false narrative that is connected obviously to white supremacy as well. Um, and just the, the false narrative overall of like who should lead to make change. We've talked about the false narratives that really drive design and how we design programs and policy and we create decisions is really um, ignoring the assets, abilities and abundance of community members and about key stakeholders. Um, a fourth dysfunction is really about alignment and accountability. And how that's shown up is how do we hold ourselves accountable to really being disruptive change makers? How do we hold each other in this community and network and beyond in our organizations and our sector accountable? Like when do we start to feel the consequences for the actions that we take that are um, harmful and that are not helping all people have equal access to justice and, and a full life. Like when do the consequences come for all of us? And it has to start inside and then it has to spread sector wide. Um, and then the, the last one is the lack of imagination in the sector. We've had amazing speakers um, like Alana Irving and Alec, Alvin Schecksneider 
and Leslie Ann Noel that have talked about Afrofuturism. And um, in New Zealand, Alana was sharing a lot of the amazing new stuff that's happening in New Zealand. And just we lack imagination of what the sector could be. And so I think our speakers have done a really beautiful job of highlighting that if we think more pluralistically, um, if we think more inclusively and more diversely and have different voices that we can create new potential futures together if we work in new ways. So I, um, I really love those themes that have popped up in dysfunction. And Devin's gonna talk about the other question we ask, which is about what's emerging that gives you hope and what some of those key themes have been. Heather, will you keep the last slide up for a minute? Oh, sure, absolutely. And I'm just curious, cause that was a lot. And I'm wondering what resonates with y'all. What is the top one or two dysfunction that is still sitting with you out of this list or others? and feel free to put it in the chat. For me, I think it's pretty obvious, or I hope it would be, white supremacy is a huge one because equity is, is as I had mentioned before, um, the thorough line through the entire basis of the foundation of the social sector. Uh, we're working towards equity. That's something that, that really sits heavy with me. And I heard there's someone in the chat who said, increasing white supremacy as a huge dysfunction. Yep. Just wanna sit with that for a second before we move over to the positive side and the optimism, because that's my jam. I love the optimistic uh, positive frames because I think there's a lot of power in self-fulfilling prophecy and bringing people along to the positive visions that we have for the world. Um, okay, so Heather, let's keep moving. Thank you for that. So these are five that I wanna to touch on as well. The first being change is actually before us. So what we see right now, I think are some incremental culture shifts that are happening, at least in our country. Uh, Decision-making is being transferred to that of staff and community par partners in places like Stepsky Foundation. Glenn Gallich was on our second episode on equity and philanthropy. And he spent the better part of the last two years transferring power to his team in decision-making for grant-making away from himself on the board. That's pretty amazing. Um, the second would be equity is more top of mind than ever before. Designers, philanthropists, consultants, and nonprofits are deeply learning from each other by talking about what it means to have an equity lens or an anti-racist lens in their programs and policies. More people than ever, we've heard from our speakers, are talking about this now compared to previously. The third point of, around what's emerging is we are redefining leadership. And this crew, the Possibility Project community, is an example of that. Leaders across the social sector are taking more personal responsibility for their mistakes, their failures, and for being conscious and mindful. They're leading by example really differently. Um, I think of a leader who um, in the philanthropy space, Carmen Rojas with the Margaret E. Casey Foundation. She is vocal about what leadership means, what equity means, and how to do things differently in philanthropy right now. And that's the type of leadership that we need. Um, each Possibility Project speaker is an example of folks who are redefining leadership. The fourth point is people are more accessible because of our technology-based world right now um, and because of the COVID era that we're in. So people are connecting in ways that they have never been able to before. And um, this series basically with Possibility Project is possible because of Zoom. We probably would have thought about doing in-person events and you know, I think have been able to access so many other people and get in front of so many other people um, because of, of being technology based. So um, it's also meant that there's a huge demand on everyone's time and people are being pulled in many different directions. So I think there is a light side and a dark side to a lot of different aspects. Um, but on to our last point around what's emerging and giving us hope is constantly we're hearing that our young people are smarter than us. Gen Z millennials um, are more values driven. They are, um, they work quicker in different ways and perhaps are more creative than people have been in the past. 
So um, as Heather referenced, Afrofuturism is really exciting. And I think there are a lot of themes and trends coming out of the Black leadership, the young Black leadership community that we should all be paying attention to. All right, we're gonna stop sharing screens and, um, and, and the video presentation is up next. And so for some inspiration, Heather and I and our wonderful production assistant, Latoya Bass, have created a video that we wanna share with you. And it's essentially highlights of the most powerful words and excerpts from our first six episodes. So after we watch the video, it's about 12, 13 minutes long, bear with us. It's really powerful. Um, try to stay focused on, on what you're watching. And uh, after we watch this, we'll send you to breakout rooms to reflect and think a little bit about um, what some of the, the topics that are covered might be great to carry into 2021 with. Green. Uh -huh. Awesome. You know, with all that's going on um, and yet another shooting yesterday, it is just so important for this conversation that we're having in terms of really addressing society's injustices from every angle. In institutional philanthropy, it's been, it's obviously the statistics are very clear there. We are reminded of them all the time. It's dominated by white privilege. It was created um, for the benefit of ensuring that we could have income tax that would strengthen the coffers of government, uh, you know, kind of an exchange with wealthy elites who were afraid of their taxes being taken. So philanthropy foundations were created as a way to um, allow those people to continue to have control and power uh, in a way that was totally unaccountable and continues to be today, really. The primary goal should not be just to grow and grow and grow and grow the foundation. The primary goal, in my humble opinion, is to make impact in the space. So it's like, I, I almost want to see us hold everyone to their words, right? If what you want is a return on investment, let's talk about the definition of return, the definition of investment. If what you want is impact, let's talk about a complete mission alignment with the entire portfolio. Marcus Garvey, my favorite historical figure, said leadership is everything, blood, pain, and death. It's not this glamorous thing if you're doing it right. If you're doing it right, you, you have sleepless nights. You got, you're questioning yourself on the regular. You're saying, man, did I mess up? You're celebrating with your people's highs. You're crying with your people's lows. Like to me, that's what is, is lost in a lot of leadership where it's become more about optics than about true emotional connection and engagement with your, your people. Um, what we typically do not talk about uh, are the endowments of foundations, uh, endowments that are going to basically hold 95% of those philanthropic assets, most likely in investments, in companies, in schemes that are quite damaging to society. We don't necessarily bring in the voices of the key stakeholders all the time. And one gentleman in our group talked about the idea around participatory grant making. How there was a lot of talk about it, but the actual action to do it it was like, duh, you, you, you've you already made the decision. You, you didn't even bring us to the table and you say this is supposed to be participatory. The power and the weight that that these concentrations of capital, this concentrated capital institutions or families or, or uh, circles of investors, the weight that they throw around the community. And what I'm starting to see now is the same uh, power plays are operating in the environment, but they're um, but they're talked about differently. Like um, almost like they're they're sugar coated, or um, you know, like the leaders will will talk about how we're we're doing this, we're doing that, and we're really trying to be open, and we're trying to have diverse voices. But then behind the scenes, behind closed doors, they still uh, pull the same move. Never questions about why are we doing this at all? Who is this serving? Why would we be the right people to do it? And, and ultimately, because of the work that we do in the social sector, what right do we have to be the people to do this work? Who else should be doing it? In fact, who else is already doing it right now that we just aren't aware of and more likely have been ignored again and again and again, and our faces being perhaps more palatable than others? Why do we get to provide a weird kind of like comfort when we show up?
because I'm pretty sure there are people who look, who have do this work, probably do it way better than we do, who are much darker skinned, who are not getting these conversations, who are not in front of those same clients and who are not getting this kind of funding and support. I just say silence is complicity. I think we've been in places and I've definitely been in situations where silent is the unsaid currency in which consultants can live in. And it's unfortunate. At times we're paid to keep our silence um, in the forms of NDAs. And other times, and I'll admit that I chose to be silent because of certain power dynamics that existed in terms of the funder relationship with consultants. And I'm just recognizing that how that silence really breeds complicity into a system that isn't working. And in the midst of this crisis right now, when we so desperately need um, more resources available, there are may many, many large foundations that are refusing to jump in to protect, hoard, and control their resources um, for some future point in time. It's, it's extremely challenging to even frame equity and philanth philanthropy in the same um, sentence. Um, it is innately structured to be inequitable. It is innately, um, you know, focused on haves and have nots. And uh, everything that we see played out, I think even in this, this pandemic moment, you know, points to the failure of philanthropy to adequately uh, devote resources to address um, systemic issues like disparities in housing and employment um, and economic opportunity. Right? At the end of the day, you know, we can design a whole bunch of programs and policies um, or, or initiatives and things like that, but at the end of the day, we really need to change systems um, because we all know that systems work the way that they were designed to work. Um, another practice is um, clearly is painting a false narrative that we can fund ourselves out of a systemic issue and we place the burden to prove that on nonprofits. So, you know, as of today, there is no proven scenario that you can program yourself out of poverty without tackling inequitable policies that are on the books, um, that have been on the books for years. Um, but philanthropy is rarely challenged to talk about those inequities that are holding those um, issues in place and so that too continues to further marginalize vulnerable communities. We get 90 percent of the charities in America have annual operating budgets at or below five million dollars. I don't know what issue we can solve with five million dollars. Homelessness, food insecurity, education, and if that's 90 percent of the charitable sector the folks that are organized to solve these issues, I think you can see why so much, so little has gotten done. Because secular charities raise about $300 billion a year. So every four years, it's $1.2 trillion that's spent. And I would love to see a show of hands later if you can tell me what really materially has improved with $1.2 trillion spent. How does philanthropy go beyond um, these Band-Aid approaches, you know, and I, I still consider diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives to be important, but they're Band-Aid approaches. I consider rapid response funds going out whenever there's a crisis, it's critically important, but they're Band-Aid approaches. We're throwing money at issues. How are we going to get to the root causes of those issues? Governments use NGOs it seemingly as a as a social backstop. Um, maybe we think of it as a safety net when its own systems fail, are incompetent, short-sighted, or intentionally relinquish responsibility. Philanthropic redlining, and for those of you all who don't know what that is, it's justifying reasons not to, to fund smaller grassroots agencies because they're viewed as risky investments or they don't fit into um, what dom dominant culture deems as stable. And so the data shows that philanthropy concentrates most of its dollars in organizations that are deemed stable, um, which typically are organizations with the infrastructure and the social capital capital to um, obtain that funding in the first place. But what this practice also does is it further marginalizes grassroots agencies because these grassroots agencies now show up 
as partners in larger organizations, but are passed down pennies on the dollars for so their own social capital and expertise and the trust that they have in the community. The things that I think we have to get rid of are old notions of charity, change and leadership. And I think until we get rid of those, we actually won't be able to address the core issues in our society. As it relates to charity, I really think that we are at the point that we need to move from charity to justice. A lot of foundations I've talked with really focus on innovation and hockey sticks. Um, however, when um, innovation occurs, a lot of foundations I've seen will shy away from new approaches because they're waiting for another foundation to step in and lead and then say, okay, great, you know, like, it makes sense. I'm not going to be, you know, a big buffoon in, in front of my organizations or my, my colleagues in the foundation space. Somebody has to fund innovation, um, period. When I think about the dysfunction, I'm talking about the narrative, the false narrative that plays out in the sector around who is a giver and who is a receiver. Who is the producer? Who is the consumer? And I think that narrative drives a lot of what we see happening and who we see sitting in places in philanthropy. Who can be an ED? Who can be a president? Who can be in the boardroom? And a lot of that is driven around what people can produce. And if people have a sense that, they, that the folks haven't produced anything, we have a narrative that pushes against people's ability to be who they are. I am not um, changing or adapting my personality um, to make you comfortable, right? This is me, this is the lens that I bring in and, and deal with it <laughs> or not, but, but you know, the fact is this is me. And so like, that's why I talk about things like plurality and identity and bringing your, your, your entire self in because you know I think we want these spaces where people come in as they are and they make our world better. So maybe now I'm designing my life like this where I'm like not wearing these masks and all of that. I am coming in as me. And if you can't deal with me as me, you can go and talk with somebody else, but this is who I am. And uh, we have 12 kind of core practices that we think are important for each of these that really addresses inequities. So how are we continuously learning and also unlearning what we've been taught um, and how that means being clear on our identities, honoring that expertise, the lived experience, changing the way we make decisions to be collaborative and really expecting everybody needs to understand inequities as part of their role. And we're really talking about philanthropy we're talking about a people that gave up self, gave up their bodies, that came across in the bottom of a ship some, who, toy, who, who tilled the soil and worked the land that created wealth. But other folks that say we're, we're philanthropists. So I've been wanting to, to, to reframe that narrative and some, in some spaces dismantle it so that folks who step up in this giving space don't start to say, hey, this is all about how much I had extra. It's all about my surplus. No, it's about your substance. 92% of leaders of, of foundations continue to be disproportionately white. Um, you do have increasing numbers of people of color um, in philanthropy, um, but they are primarily at the levels of program officers or program associates. They're not individuals who can really really drive um, strategic um, grant making in really powerful ways. Um, and in many cases, these are individuals who come into philanthrop philanthropy who end up being marginalized themselves because they're people of color. And they're made to feel that, um, you know, it's a gift in and of itself, you know, to sit in a, in a position within a foundation uh, where you have resources, um, you know, to grant. It's like, who really wants to give up power? <laughs> you know, I mean, that at the end of the day, if you have power, why would you want to give it up? And I think that's the struggle that we're always going to face when we look at ways that we can really dismantle racist practices and principles and create 
you know, workplaces, organizations, and even a society that works effectively for all of us. Oh my goodness. I know I was smiling the whole time because each of these speakers are ridiculously powerful. Oh my goodness, I'm just gonna pause for a second and just let those set in. Oh. A couple of people had to hop off, but the fun thing about these conversations being recorded is that we have like hundreds of viewers watch this on YouTube afterwards. So uh, hopefully we'll have some great folks joining the conversation after this one. Eating my own dog food, you know, the work that I do in Lean Innovation is we have to talk to folks, right? We have to do empathy work. We need to do interviewing and connecting. And so Devin and I selected a handful of folks that have attended sessions in the past, and we wanted to find out more about um, what they liked, what could be better, like what they're thinking about, get to know them a little more. So we combined, and, and this is a summary of what we heard from people, is that people love the format and the evolving conversation. They like the combo of the breakout rooms and the jumping around with different speakers. They like the speakers and their vulnerability, which we mentioned. Um, they like networking and connecting with like-minded folks in the breakout room. A lot of folks, you know, they, you can attend a webinar. Sometimes you can't interact with anyone. You just have to listen or interact on the chat or you're attending conferences, but this gives you another outlet to be able to meet other people um, that are similar. And some people had mentioned, of course, that they have new thinking or further their existing thinking. Um, one of the people we interviewed said this has been like the best professional development that she's ever had. Just attending these to really think more expansively than what she's normally exposed to. And then that they're reliable and consistent. No, and I thought that was funny that people were like, you always end on time. And we really appreciate that with our calendar. And then it's it's like, you know, what's going to happen in terms of the, the format. So that was fun to hear. Um, what people wanted more of is they wanted more time to connect with others. So uh, this is helpful for us to think about. And action steps. I love the idea of case studies and, uh, you know, what it looked like in real world. But what can people do as individuals to be different and, and take action? And um, I love in our conversation with Chuck and, and Julie and, um, and we're talking about... Um, this when I was jumping to action, we still have to be cautious in doing that and not fall into that um, colonial thinking trap. So I love that. I really want to expand on that. And going deeper on topics, um, a lot of folks have been stimulated by very specific topics. So we want to provide more content and either have multiple sessions or different types of sessions, which we'll talk about in a bit. And then some folks said they want to practice. They want to practice trying new things together. So how could they go deeper in a community where they can learn with each other and feel safe? Um, and then people just said more, like keep the episodes coming, keep it going for 2021. So that's awesome. Um, just checking the chat here. Okay, make sure everybody's good. Um, so in terms of season two, we thought that was kind of funny. Someone referred to it as season two, so we act like we're some sort of Netflix show or something, but um, we want to have some fun with the format and content, knowing that we'll probably stick around that 90 minute mark, but how can we engage some of the, um, the recommendations? How do we in include those? So you'll see some things that we might try some experimentation with next year. So bear with us and give us feedback. And then for fundraising, um, some of you may not know that since March is when we started our early conversations in May was when the first episode was. Since then, all of this has been a complete volunteer um, adventure <laughs> for Devin and I. We, um, we've paid for everything with our own money. We've done everything with our time. And so we really want to explore what it would look like to have individual support and foundation support. So some of those, you know, activities that we have to do is, um, you know, LaToya, we, we support LaToya Bass, who's our amazing administrative support person. So covering, you know, her cost and then all the activities. So recruiting and prepping our speakers, um, you know, uh, create, curating the, the conversations, putting together the marketing, doing the outreach, putting the videos together and putting those online and keeping that spreading. So we are going to be reaching out to folks to see if you can help or if you know someone that can. So we would love your support in that. And um, we will be held under a fiscal um, umbrella. So we will have 501c3 status for tax deductible gifts. 
So that's helpful for folks. And we really wanna keep this free. We've had a lot of conversations about membership models or paywalls or different things. And we really want it to be 100% accessible because that really aligns with our ideas around equity and justice and access for all. So um, we'll be in touch about those things. And then for the deeper dive, we have our first um, deep dive episode coming up on January the 21st at noon uh, Pacific. And George A from the consultants episode around enabling dismantling status quo, he's going to be back for a free two hour session that's all about gut check. And he introduced the concept of gut check, which is what he does um, with his team every time they get a new potential client or proposal that crosses their, their path. They have a list of questions that they go through as a team to decide, is this values aligned? Is this, um, does, this uh, does it align with who we are and the type of impact we wanna make? And could we make more impact with different clients? So what are the opportunity costs that are connected to that? So he's gonna walk us through the gut check. And then we hope to have another deep dive around this idea of decolonizing our thinking as change makers. So we're looking at that for March. So to be, to be continued and announced. And then the new website, which we've mentioned. So please check it out. You can send us a little note on there and there's a form um, that you can complete. And then for um, coming soon for, or the website, sorry, Devin, you put this together. Thank you. These are just some screenshots and Sarah Beatty has been amazing in helping us. So if you need help with website support, please look her up and connect with her. She's awesome. She's done so much great work. So let us know any ideas or feedback. And so some of the upcoming events that we have um, in January, the second week of January, we're still confirming the exact day and time. We're going to talk about the role of arts, arts and culture, um, artists and arts and culture organizations and helping us reimagine what's possible. So we wanna highlight multiple artists that are really part of this protest movement and helping really redefine the sector. Um, January 21st at noon, like I said, Pacific will be George A. And then in early February, the second week of February, we're looking at having a topic around radical allyship. What is allyship and action really look like? Not just performative and statements, like what does it actually look like on an individual and organizational level? And then the week of um, the 22nd, we're hoping of February, we wanna focus on what it looks like to center blackness and black power in the way that we design and heal. And so again, curating amazing panelists, having super awesome conversations as we wrap up this year. Uh, but that's really what's cooking and what we're focused on. And we wanna take everything that you've mentioned today to help us inform uh, next year. So keep them coming. Thank you for that, Heather. I love listening to you talk. I just, it's, it's the way, I love it. The way that you engage really is refreshing for me. So stick with us. We're in our final wrap up stage. We have a couple more minutes and I want to talk with you about this resource compilation that we're going to send to you all after this conversation. So each of our speakers, we've had mostly two or three speakers on every episode and each of them has curated according to the topic, probably eight to 10 pieces of like core resources that they use in their work that they recommend for the audience to look up. So we're going to put that together in one document for you. And you can spend your Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa looking at it because I've seen all of the resources. Um, Heather and I have put them together in a recap email for the attendees after each session, but I wanna look them all up again and I want that to inform my work moving forward. And so hopefully we can bring up these resources again and again over the next Conversations with Possibility Project that y'all can use it in your practice and with your networks and communities and um, that we can build off of them. Um, I know that some of our speakers, a good example, Leslie Ann Noel in Louisiana, who teaches design, has said that she's already coming out with a version, I think three, of her, her designer's critical alphabet that Heather and I both have bought a lot of so far. I bought both of those for my clients this, this year, and it's just amazing. So more is coming, which is exciting. Um, right now, in the last couple minutes, I want to talk about takeaways. And so as we plan for 2021, 
Um, we're going to take all that we learned today and that we heard from all of you about the topics and, and what you want to discuss and who you think we should hear from and, um, you know, keep planning for next year. And we want to hear speakers and topics more so that you recommend. Um, we have a form that we're going to put in the chat that if you think about someone or come across someone in the next couple weeks or months and you're like, oh, I would love to hear them speak please recommend them and add it to the form. And we look at that. Um, and, and I think, you know, I want to turn to you, Heather, and I want to ask you uh, for, for your takeaways from today and also from a full season of Possibility Project. Oh, mm, gosh. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> there have been moments that Deb and I have been rushing to get things done and it's been stressful because we both run our own separate businesses right we have our own client loads and projects and family lives and so it's like ah, it's possibly project week we got to do this so um I'm just filled with gratitude. I'm so thankful for everyone that has attended and our amazing speakers who we have never paid like all of our speakers, we talked about us being volunteers, all of our speakers have volunteered, which is absolutely phenomenal. And they've, they've continued to volunteer. We do quarterly speaker chats where we have like a speakers club. So we invite all the speakers only to come to their own session and we facilitate a 90 minute event for them and they love it. And a lot of them are now like BFFs so they weren't already. And it's just glorious. So I think my takeaways is that I wanna keep on keeping on I want to keep the love going, keep the stimulating conversations going and keep engaging in this community of change makers to see what we can do. And I, I love the idea of shifting towards action, um, and, but action with cautious progression, I would say I really want to go deeper with that personally and collectively. So that's very, um, it's a good provocation to lead into for the next year. So yeah, that's what I'm really thinking about top of mind and what's for um, coming soon. Oh, my heart is so full. And now is a good time to ask you all what takeaways you have to share in the chat. And Heather, it's also a good time for me to just say thank you for being my partner in this and mm -hmm. for teaching me and letting me learn with you. And um, I would say my takeaways are one, I am inspired to be better personally. I'm inspired to be a better facilitator. Gosh, I've had so many stumbles on Zoom, <laughs> like we all have. And um, I've had stumbles in, in many different aspects. And so I just am really wanting to be better. And next year, I think this community is really an accountability community to some degree of like holding me to a, a higher standard. Um, and, and I love that because y'all are awesome. Super, super awesome. Another takeaway for me is um, just kind of allowing my space, my, allowing myself space and time to be where I'm at. I talk to my clients constantly about how I'm able to meet them where they're at and understand through an empathetic lens, you know, how to build them up and create capacity where it wasn't there before. And I can do that for myself in better ways. Um, making sure that I meet myself where I'm at. And I think we all might resonate with that um, of being our own best support and being the kindest to ourselves as we can, um, given the extreme demands and commitments that we've made working in the work that we work in. Uh, excuse the background noise. So something I'll just call out that someone shared, a takeaway being that they're not alone in thinking about these issues and wanting to continue to dig into this work, totally. Love that. Um, I had added the link for LinkedIn, uh, the URL. So if you haven't already joined, join. This is mostly for folks who are watching afterwards. Um, and I want to wrap today by sharing a huge thank you to each of you for joining us today. And for those who are watching at home on your couch and um, want to just um, share you know, if, if, if you've enjoyed what you have seen today, please share this around um, and share such gratitude for our speakers, the community that has shown up over and over and um, to my co-creator, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. It's been awesome. You're great. And that's it for today. So be well and see you in early 2021. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye y'all. Bye.